So it's important when you're in an industry, you keep a pulse on the industry and um, changes that might happen because these changes affect your business because you're in the business of getting results. And if you're not getting any results, you know, you're going to have unhappy clients. Unhappy clients mean complaints. It means you're going to say this, they're going to say that, ruin your company reputation. But not only that, you now start doubting yourself, which is the biggest thing. Because it doesn't matter what anybody says you know. Bang, you want to you say, say again, please. <laughs> How you doing? So it doesn't matter what anybody says. But you see, the minute you start doubting yourself, that's where you have issues. So like I said, it's one of these reasons why we're going to dive into this right now. So what I'm doing tonight is an overview. We'll just be going in an overview. It's not going to be a full analysis of the new rule because that's going to take at least four to five hours going through line by line, reading all the comments, but I'll give you where to go. So a lot of us, we're used to Cornell Law. Um, I've been checking on Cornell Law. They haven't updated it yet with the new ruling. So right now I'm taking information from the CFPB. Recording so, in you, so if you guys type in jumping all over the place, Cash. All right, cool. All right, Cash, so I just made you co-host. So you'll see people that's trying to come in and just let them in for me while I redirect my focus. All right, so let me share the screen. Can y'all see the screen? Yeah, 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 we see it, we see it. I bet. All right, so like I said earlier, you wanna start taking until Legal Institute or Cornell Law updates the um, 15 USC 1692 section of um, the law on there, it's better if you go here to the CFPB. So if you type in 12 CFR part 1006 or regulation F, it's going to bring in, it's gonna bring you to the FDCPA. So the FDCPA has a couple other names. 12 CFR part 1006, that's also another name for the FDCPA. Regulation F is another name for the FDCPA. 15 USC 1692 is also another name for the FDCPA. So just get familiar with, um, with the different language that they're using, but they're all the same thing. And this is where you're gonna get the most up-to-date information and it's gonna even give you commentaries. It's gonna give you commentaries. It's gonna give you a lot because uh, we knew before there was eight definitions. Well, the definitions also changed. They, um, the definition of a consumer, that has also changed. Um, they've added consumer goods or consumer services. So there's, a, there's new words or new language in there that, um, that change the whole dynamics of the FDCPA. 
So let me get this on prevent uh, presenter's view. Let's get this over here. All right, slideshow. Can you all still see the screen? Cash, can you see the screen? Yep. Okay, and you're seeing the PowerPoint? PowerPoint? Yeah. So I wanted to do this new thing, but it's not doing it. Right. Duran, click slideshow and then click play from current slide at the top. Where do you see that? Okay, slide. Oh, right there, yep. And okay. then click play from current slide. Yeah, so I did it, but it keeps going over to my other monitor. That's the problem I'm having. Can you just drag it across? Because you must be looking at two screens. See if you could take it from the other screen and just drag it across the other one. Okay. Otherwise, it's probably in presentation mode. Okay, let me try this again. Drag it over. Nope, it's not dragging at all. No, okay. So you're probably in presentation mode. Let me See? I am not the most computer savvy person in this room right now. All right, you know what? We'll just we we'll just go with this. All right, we'll just we'll do it this way. Y'all can still see it, right? We'll just yeah, we'll make this part work. <clears throat> All right, so y'all should be seeing the first slide, which is a picture of me, a very handsome guy, about to go ham on this FDCPA. If that's what y'all seen, let me know and I'll just go through. I don't know what's going on with the presentation. All right, we're good? <clears throat> All right. Now, the other reasons why I'm showing y'all this. So when y'all do y'all webinars, when y'all do y'all Zooms and stuff, it's important that y'all are showing your products because the offer you don't make is the offer they can take. Now, I teach consumer law. Most of you on here know this. That's the reason why you're here. So it's important, it's extremely important that your products are always showing 100% because there might be somebody on this on this call right now that's interested in my mentorship, that's interested in a single product. But if I showed none of this, I wouldn't be able to help somebody who needs something. You get what I'm saying? So it's one of the reasons why I'm so hard on the team to make sure that y'all have your digital products ready because people need the things that you do. It's important, everybody on this call, as much as we're doing an FDCPA call, it's important that y'all have your products. It doesn't matter if you do credit repair or if you're doing mentorship, it doesn't matter. Because if you're doing credit repair and you have the ebook, the ebook could be a preliminary where they purchase the ebook. It's a, re it's, it's a recommended asset that they cannot sign up with you until they get the ebook. So what the ebook is gonna do, the ebook is going to teach them. So now they're gonna be aware. So the whole process, they'll be able to answer better questions. So I urge everyone on this call, get your ebooks out and put it as a part of your package. And when you service your clients for credit repair, make the ebook a part of it. So you can include the cost of the ebook in what you charge them or you could make it a separate offer, but for you to work with them, the ebook is a part of it because they need to learn. And that's one way now where you do that forced sale, where you're able to sell your ebook to all your clients. So I really hope that helps somebody. All right, so rulemaking overview, right? Notice of proposed rulemaking 78 FR. FR mean federal regulation is just a bunch of rules because they've been, so 2013, they did a rule change. 2016, they did a review. And as you can see, the last one was done November 30, 2021, which was 16 days ago. And this is the one that's in effect right now. And as I said earlier, the definitions have changed for a lot of things. So before consumer men, um, 
should I? No, I'm not going to pull it up. Right? So the old definition for consumer is different now. The word consumer now means any natural person, whether living or deceased, obligated or allegedly obligated to pay any debt. Before, that was not the definition. All right? Um, and there's still an extended definition. So if you type in 1006.6a, is going to bring you to that part on the CFPB website that I was telling you about where the new rule regulation F has been updated. So definitions, consumer financial product or service, right? Same meaning as 10055 of the Dodd-Frank Act. And what this simple is, is 12 USC 54815, where the financial product or services offered are provided for use by consumers, primarily for personal, family, or household purposes include. So now they're telling you that the FDCPA applies to consumer financial products, and now it's going to list what the new rule or what the FDCPA now um, covers. The extension of credit and servicing of loans, brokerage or leases of real and personal property, real estate settlement or appraisal services, deposit taking activities, or otherwise acting as a custodian of funds of any financial instrument. Y'all need to um, get savvy too with these words, financial instrument. It, it, so you'll hear um, tender payment, you'll hear financial instrument, promissory notes. These are all forms of legal tender. It, there is no money. There is no money since 1933. We're operating on Federal Reserve note. The only thing that is as close as it is, believe it or not, to real money is the $1 bill. This is the closest thing to real money. Um, prepaid debit cards and other stored value instrument, check cashing, collection, or guarantee services, payment processing, or other financial payment processing, financial advisory services, credit reporting services, and debt collection, uh, 12 USC uh, 5481.15. So time bar debt. So what time bar debt is, um, a lot of us know it as statute of limitations, like say for instance, the statute of limitation to collect on a credit card debt in the state of New York. That is what it means when the, the FDCPA or the Bureau of uh, Consumer Protection Finance say time bar debt, right? <clears throat> so statute of limitation means the period prescribed by applicable law for bringing a legal action against the consumer to collect a debt Time bar debt means a debt for which the applicable statute of limitation has expired. So now with the new rule, if there's a if, if, if there's a time bar debt, debt collectors they have to disclose that now it's a time bar debt and they cannot threaten to take legal action on a time bar debt. It's a violation of the new rule. Legal actions and threat of legal actions prohibited. A debt collector must not bring or threaten to bring a legal action against a consumer to collect a time bar debt. So the word here, must. When you see must not, it means they have to comply with it. If it had said a debt collector may not bring, that's a different statement. The word must is a command, it's an order. You must do this. You may do this gives you an option. And in this case, the new rule says a debt collector must not bring or threaten to bring a legal action against a consumer to collect a time barred debt. Consistent with case law, holding that suits and threats of suits on time barred debt violate the FDCPA, section 1692E. So the source for this, um, if y'all write this down, 1006.26B, that is where this information is on the CFPB website. 
And if you, you'll notice that everything that I'm saying, the source is here where I got the information from. So the rain isn't just here making stuff up. This is coming directly from the CFPB website. Did not adopt the no or should know standard. Strict liability standard may be able to use a bona fide error defense for error of fact, not errors of law. So basically what this is saying that they should know and ignorance of the law is no excuse. So if we go here and we look up what the definition of a bona fide debt means, um, can you share? <clears throat> um, can you all see, I'm on Google, can you all see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you type in bona fide error, it says a bona fide error is an unintentional mistake or oversight that may be corrected promptly to avoid exposure to legal action. So what Congress is now saying, um, are y'all seeing the PowerPoint now? Because I'm back on the PowerPoint. No, it's still on Google. Okay. Okay, we should be back in the PowerPoint. Yep. Okay, perfect. So whether they say they don't know or I didn't know this, no. You, you under strict liability, you must comply. So now if we put them on notice that certain information is incorrect, certain information is inaccurate, they have a responsibility, not only now under the FDCPA, but under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, because 15 U.S.C. 1681 S2 speaks about the responsibilities of, of um, furnishers of information to consumer reporting agencies. So now you're now taking them not only under FDCPA, but you're bringing them under FCRA jurisdiction as well. So now the civil liability for both sections apply. All right, does not apply to proof of claim in a bankruptcy. All right, so I want y'all to look this case law up <clears throat> and y'all can read it. Um, Midland Funding LLC versus Johnson 137 SCT. Um, and you can read about this part. Uh, this talks about proof of claim. So another thing that we need to start using in our correspondence is the correct word. And when we finish this, we're going to go into that because what I notice a lot of a lot of people are using words that are not in the FCRA, that are not in the FDCPA, and y'all are not getting results. And then you're wondering, you know, <clears throat> I'm sending out my correspondences, but why am I not getting results? Well, if you're talking about credit report and credit bureau and you're calling them these things, you're not going to get results because number one, there is no credit bureau. That is a false word. There is no credit bureau. Under the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, credit bureau is not a word defined under the FCRA. It doesn't exist. Credit report is not there either. Consumer report is there. Consumer file is there. So we need to get in the correct habit of using the correct words. That's how you're going to get your deletion when you start using the correct words. So when y'all get the time, <clears throat> write this case law down, take a screenshot, whatever y'all want to do, but go read up on that case law. <clears throat> All right, time bar debt disclosures. Proposed time bar debt and revival disclosures were not finalized. Too many concerns, burden on the debt collectors and confusion to consumer. So what they're saying here with the time bar debt, um, they proposed that disclosures were supposed to be made, but they haven't finalized on that. There's only comments because the burden of proof, as we know, is on he who that is bringing the claim. Right, But they're complaining now that it's going to be too much of a burden on the debt collectors and it's going to confuse the consumer. So there's still ambiguity here. So now where ambiguity is, 
I say you exert the things that you want. So you take over this part as it um, relates to time bar debt disclosures and you enforce it the way you want to enforce it because <clears throat> the law isn't clear on that. So if you take that part over and demand what you want, who knows, you might start seeing some remedies. And when it comes to time bar debts, or as some people know it and call it statute of limitations, each state has different statute of limitations. So the statute of limitations for collecting on certain debts is different from New York, than Missouri, than Atlanta, I mean, than Georgia, than Connecticut, like it's all different. And these are just some examples of state that has time bar debt like California, Connecticut, North Carolina, Texas, West Virginia, Massachusetts, New Mexico, New York, Vermont, New York City, and the city of Yonkers. All right, so the CFPB encourages debt collectors to disclose anyway. So you see this word? It says encourages. So it is not fact. It is not law that they have to do it. They encourage it, but they didn't say you must do it. So if a debt collector reserved the right to disclose, it's not a violation because the CFPB only says they encourage it. It's not mandatory. But in many circumstances, disclosures can effectively cure the potential deception associated with the collection of time bar debt, which is absolutely true. Because let's say you're coming up on, um, let's say a credit card debt and you're in the state of New York and it's six years and then you're at um, five years, um, 300 days and a debt collector just popped out of nowhere and they threaten you with legal action, we're gonna bring you to court, all of that stuff to start over the statute of limitation. But not only that, in their deceptive correspondence, you now went ahead to pay that alleged debt. Well, what that simply means is it's a violation of the law because what they're saying is, now you they gotta tell you this. So when it comes to that part where you're coming up on the statute of limitation. They cannot do any deceptive marketing, any deceptive means of communication to bring you back with the statute of limitation. So they must tell you that um, there's a statute of limitation and that this is what's gonna happen if you make a payment. So a debt collector may decide that to avoid violating the FDCPA and the final rule, the debt collector needs to disclose information to consumers about the debt collector's ability to sue and the possibility of revival. And in that case, the debt collector may do so. So this is what I was just explaining. When it comes to the time bar debt, they need to make it very, very clear that when you pay on this, it resets the statute of limitation. And they must tell you that if it's only one month left on the debt, they cannot threaten to bring legal action. Uh, where were we? Okay, so now we're here. Now, other prohibited practices, no passive collection parking. So, there's a word now that they use, it's called debt parking, right? And what, some of you might be hearing this for the first time, but I'm gonna go into more and explain what debt parking is. So they can't, this is law now, this is law. And this is gonna change the game. And let me show you, when I read this, I was like, no, they did not. <clears throat> I'm gonna drop, drop a huge gem. I'm gonna drop a whole diamond right now. <clears throat> no passive collection, all right, we know that. Can't report a debt to credit reported agency. So <clears throat> N NCLC have credit reporting agency. It's not credit reporting agency. This is consumer. And we need to get into the habit, consumer reporting agencies of using the correct word, right? So can't report a debt to consumer reporting agencies before, listen, listen, listen to words coming out of my mouth right now. 
can't report a debt to a consumer reporting agency before first contacting the consumer. Do y'all understand what Congress just did? Like, do y'all really comprehend how much of a game changer this is? It further goes to say before reporting debt collector must. All right, so can't report a debt to a consumer reporting agency before first contacting the consumer, before reporting debt collectors must. So this is what they must do before they can report any debt, any alleged debt to the consumer reporting agency. Speak to the consumer in person or by phone, right? Come on, I want y'all to follow me. They must <clears throat> mail a letter or electronic communication to the consumer and wait at least 14 days for notice of undeliverability. If receives notice of undeliverability, cannot report unless achieves communication detailed above. All right, right now, Cash, I want you, to, I don't even know if a bear and Nish is on. Um, Cash, right now, I want to give at least five people the ability to speak. The five people that I'm giving the ability to speak right now, make sure that you have a credit report in business. If you don't, um, it, it, this works for, it works either way, but if you have a credit repair business, it's better because this now is gonna be a game changer for you educating your clients. So um, just give people the ability to speak. I'll just do, I'm not even gonna do five, I'm gonna do three. Do y'all comprehend what this section means? I wanna get some feedback on this section. <coughs> so um, you can unmute now. You can raise your hand. I see Cody put something in the chat. Okay, iPhone. Come on, people. Let's go. I want to hear y'all thoughts on this. Cause are y'all ready? Yeah, let's go, bro. Let's go. Yeah, I got a question, right? So, does this mean that um they can't report? They can't report it. They can't basically report it to um collections unless they have a a detailed communication with the client. Yes. So let's like go back over it. <clears throat> so if the client doesn't answer or you know they're not able to speak to the client, they can't add it on your credit report. Right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Okay. This is where the diamond is now because we need to comprehend the words that are being used here. It says they can't can't report a debt to a consumer reporting agency before first contacting the consumer. So if, if they don't contact the consumer, it cannot be reported. That's number one. However, there's stipulations now to how they can contact. So when we go here now, when it says before reporting, so before it reports, this must be done. They must speak to the consumer in person or by phone. So if I never spoke with them, they can't put it there. Uh -huh. The second part says mail a letter or electronic communication to the consumer. And after they mail it, they have to wait 14 days for a notice of undeliverability. Do y'all comprehend that if you see a letter from a debt collector and you send that letter back, return to sender, undeliverable, they cannot put that account there? Yeah, I, yep. Like, I really want you to follow me on this. It says mail a letter or electronic communication to the consumer and wait at least 14 days for a notice of undeliverability. So every time they send you the mail, you send it right back. Like, do you all know what <laughs> Congress crazy. just did? Yeah, it's pal. It sounds simple. It sounds so simple. But if game they don't real. communicate with you, the debt cannot go on the report. So if every time they send a correspondence, you send it back, 
by law, they cannot report it. Return to sender, undeliverable. <laughs> Yo, when I read this, I was cracking up. All right, so I'm going to ask Cash to put everybody back on mute. I know I just said three people, but I really just explained all of it so it wouldn't be, make much sense now to have the other two. All right, so let me go back here. I'll take questions at the end. Don't think I'm not going to take questions. I will. <clears throat> and if you all hear my voice like this, um, last night I was running a 101 fever and, you know, uh, I wasn't feeling so good today, but I wasn't going to cancel the Zoom because this is something that I wanted to bring to y'all for a very long time, especially now that there's changes. So if y'all hear my voice going in and out, it's because I'm currently sick, but I wasn't going to cancel the Zoom. What if a collector sends to a consumer and after no notice of undeliverability in 14 days, reports to the CRAs, but then on the 15th day, they um, return as undeliverable. So this part is very important. So the law gives them 14 days, right? So if you receive the mail, you must send it back within that time frame. If it gets delivered to them on the 15th day, well, they're in compliance. So everything you're doing must be done in the 14 day window. Because on the 15th day, there's a rule called the safe harbor rule, which now protects them. And they're able to put it on the consumer report. Because Congress said, if they didn't get the undeliverability in 14 days, then <clears throat> they can assume now that the consumer received the notice or the correspondence. So on the 15th day, they can now put it on the report. So it's important that y'all are, and you're telling your clients that y'all need to be on top of your mail because when these things come in, you got to send it right back. Because if it hits the 15th day and they didn't get the undeliverability, then they can put it on there. So that's a caveat to, um, <clears throat> that's a caveat to that. All right, credit report can park and rule continue. Exclusion, prohibition on passive collection does not apply to a debt collector furnishing of information about a debt to a nationwide specialty consumer reporting agency that complies with uh, complies and maintains information on a consumer's check writing history. So basically, they're making it very specific. They're talking about check systems. That rule, the parking rule for the 14 days, it doesn't apply if they're reporting to check systems. They can do it. Congress gave them the right to report to check systems or other consumer uh, reporting agencies that maintains information on a consumer's check writing history. So check systems is one that the rule, they excluded from the rule. All right, validation notices, organization. <clears throat> Methods for sending validation information, right? Uh, we're gonna go into definitions, required validation information, form of validation information, translation into other languages. So methods for sending. Um, in writing, of course, so they can do in writing, which is your regular paper snail mail, mm -hmm. or they can go electronically and electronically now covers um, emails, DMs, social media, all of that stuff. The initial communication or within five days of the initial communication, orally in the initial communication except um, exceptions, collector not required to provide validation information if the consumer paid the debt prior to the expiration of the fifth day period. So basically the disclosures that they must give under um, <clears throat> the disclosures that they must give under the validation of debt section, if the consumer pays the debt within five days of the initial communication, they don't have to send it. And in writing or electronically, so the valid, so what you can do is write down 1006 um, point three four a and this is the section that speaks on validation of debt and it's going to give you a lot more information like i said this is only an overview 
it, the law is much more extensive than this. Um, validation notice sent in writing or electronically must be one, sent in a manner reasonably expected to provide actual notice and in a form that the consumer may keep and access later. Must comply with the eSign Act if sent electronically. So <clears throat> if they're using now electronic means of communication, there's an act called the eSign Act where it stipulates what must be done and how it must be done when it comes to electronic correspondences. And that is covered under the eSign Act. So y'all can write that down and read it when you get a chance. But um, electronic delivery of the validation notice in an initial communication. So <clears throat> initial communication is very important. deceased consumers. So now <laughs> Congress, Congress has included the dead in the definition of consumer. So if a collector knows or should know the consumer is deceased and did not provide validation information to the deceased consumer, it's stupid, but even the dead now, the Congress is still saying that they can come after you, but there, the person that's in charge of the estate. Um, <clears throat> so that's who the debt collectors are going to go to. So let's say I pass away, but then I have um, I have my wife, or I have a trustee, or members, or whoever that now controls the estate. Well, <clears throat> the debt collector now they have to find who is in charge of the estate and direct communications to them regarding an, an, an alleged debt that I supposedly owed before I passed. It must provide validation information to the individual that the collector identifies as authorized to act on behalf of the deceased consumer. So that's all that you're saying there. Who now manages the estate or uh, the assets of the consumer? So the definitions are um, clear and conspicuous means readily understandable, written, readily noticed and live, uh, legible, no minimum fund size. So even though they didn't give a minimum fund size, but it must be readily noticeable and le um, legible. So they can't have it in fund size one and say, no, no, it's there, it's fund size one. No, it's not readily understandable. Who can read that? Nobody can read that. <clears throat> um, oral, um, you know, those commercials where they're giving the disclosures and they're speaking the disclosures at 100 miles per minute. No, they can't do that. So volume and speed sufficient for the consumer to hear and comprehend. So if you are not able to comprehend what they're saying, it's a violation of the section. Initial communication. First time conveys information directly or indirectly about a debt to the consumer. Um, so initial communication is the first time you are hearing from XYZ collection. That first communication is the initial communication. <clears throat> and the initial communication cannot be legal pleading. So if you're just hearing from a debt collector, the first conversation, the first, the first, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The first communication cannot be legal pleading. It cannot say, you know, you need to go to court. No, the validation of debt must be done first. <clears throat> I'm going to say that again. There must be an opportunity to dispute the debt, a validation of debt, a 15 U.S.C. 1692G. They must give you an opportunity to dispute the alleged debt. The first communication cannot be legal pleading. It cannot. 
All right. Um, let me see now. Where am I? Definitions again. Itemized date, one of the five reference dates. So now Congress tells them they are able to pick, but they have to be consistent. So if they're going to talk and refer to a date, they can pick from the last statement date, the charge off date, the last payment date, transaction date, judgment date. Collector chooses and must use the same reference date consistently while collecting on that account. So they can't use a charge off date and then they're gonna say, oh, we're using the payment date as reference. They can't do that. They gotta pick one and stick with it. And you can read more on that on 1006.34b. And you'll see, go to the, um, the comments and you'll see the discussion that they had when they were um, putting this law together or on the new rule. <clears throat> so um, validation notice, written or electronic notice providing validation information. <clears throat> um, validation period runs from date validation information is provided until 30 days after received or assumed receive. Now, can assume receipt five days after provided. So if you ask for a validation of a debt and they send it back to you, if you don't respond in 30 days, right? Five days after that 30 days, they can assume you've received it and that they completed or did their due diligence on providing you. So it's important that you reply to these um, collection companies when you get correspondences within a 30 day period. Don't just leave it out there and think it's gonna disappear because Congress says they can assume receipt five days after, after it's provided. So the 30 days and then five days then it's excluding the weekends and holidays. They can assume now that you've gotten it and your silence is your acquiescence and that you agree to it. Required validation information. Debt collector communication disclosure must provide the disclosure required by 1006.18E. Now, wording used in model validation notice. So Congress is saying now, that there's a specific language that must be used. Because you know, when they do the mini Miranda, um, this is a debt collector and any information used will, any information gathered will be used in an attempt to collect a debt. So Congress is saying that the, their, um, that mini Miranda must take this form. So an example, North South Group is a debt collector we are trying to collect a debt that you owe to the Bank of Rockville. We will use any information you give us to help collect the debt. So it must have this framework. They can't just say anything. It must follow this framework. And if it doesn't follow this framework, it's a violation of the new rule. So you can look that part up at 1006.34C1. So um, you'll see the sources here. So if I read something and you wanna do more reading on it, just look at the source and write it down and then you go Google it. Required validation information. Information about the debt. Debt collector's name and mailing address. Consumer's name and mailing address. Name of the creditor on the itemization date, <clears throat> account number on itemization date, name of current creditor, whoever has it, itemization date, amount of the debt on the itemization date, itemization of interest fees payments and credits, <clears throat> and credits since itemization date, current amount of the debt. So these validation requirements or validation information is only required for consumer financial product. And in the beginning, I told you what a consumer financial product is, and this is what the new rule applies to, service debt. So under the Dodd-Frank Act, you wanna look up consumer financial product. 
this is what the FDCPA now is geared towards. Required validation information. Information about consumer protections. Date, date validation period ends and information about the right to dispute, information about the right to seek original creditor information, a statement that collector will assume the collector will assume the debt validation if not disputed before that date. So, excuse me. So <clears throat> this part that we speak about here, a statement that a collector will assume debt valid if not disputed before that date. So we just spoke about the 30 days. The 30 days, after 30 days plus five days, they can assume the debt to be valid. This is what that is talking about. So within that 30 day period, it is imperative that if a consumer or any of your clients get the correspondence, they must reply. But in this case, because you own the company, you must reply because you are acting as a fiduciary on behalf of the consumer that paid you to be their representative in this situation. So, <clears throat> It's important that y'all are keeping conversations with your clients and y'all letting them know as soon as the information comes in, as soon as you see the correspondence, I need to know, you need to scan it, send it to me, take a picture, send it to me because you need to do the rebuttal within that 30, 35 day period or they're gonna assume the debt to be valid. Link to CFBB website for more information, you can just, go by the source. If validation notice is sent electronically, information about how to dispute debt or request original creditor, information electronically, only required for consumer financial products. So like I said, they're being very specific now how the FDCPA applies to certain things. And it only applies now to consumer um, financial products. So required validation information, consumer response information, dispute prompts, right? <clears throat> I want to dispute the debt because I think this is not my debt, the amount is wrong. Other, please describe on reverse or So right here, where it says that um, these are some of the prompts that you can use, right? I want to dispute the debt because I think, no, 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 no. So even though Congress is saying this, but let's evaluate the words, right? I want to dispute the debt because I think, no, you're not thinking, you know that the debt is not yours. You know that the debt is inaccurate. You know that under 15 USC, 1681 S3, Congress clearly says that the information provided must be accurate. So if I put you on notice that the information, is, the information is inaccurate, by law, you cannot report inaccurate information on my consumer report, and that is law. So when we talk about round one, round two, round three. I know a lot of us get that from, um, from CRC. And, you know, it, it, it um, mm, there's levels to it, right? And when you're talking about consumer laws, the way you speak to them is using their own language. You cannot speak to someone who speaks Spanish and only knows Spanish in Chinese. There's a gap between the communication. You must speak to them in their own language. Their own language is the laws that are put in place that governs them. They have to know these words. So why do you wanna make up words and call them credit bureau and credit report? These words don't exist. There is no credit bureau. That is a false word. There is no credit report. You have a consumer report. You have your consumer file. You have consumer reporting agencies. 
Stop giving them names that are not theirs. They do not have to respond to you because if, if I send a letter and your name is James Brown, your name is James Brown, and I send a letter to James Wellington, I, I didn't send a letter to you. So you don't have to respond to me because it wasn't directed to me. You called me something other than my name. Right? So you called me something other than my name. I don't need to respond to you. I don't. So it's important that you are calling them by their name. There is no credit bureau. There is none. Please start using the correct words. All right. Let's... Did we finish this? Original credit information. I want to send, I want you to send me the name address of the original creditor. We know we're the original creditor, right? Mailing addresses for the consumer and the debt collector must be at the bottom of the validation notice under the headings. How do you want to respond and check how that applies? All right, required validation information special rule for certain residential mortgage debt. If a collector provides with the validation notice, a copy of the most recent regulation Z, 12 CFR 102641, be periodic statement and includes a reference to the statement on the validation notice where the itemization would normally appear, then the debt collector does not need to provide an itemized date. They don't need to provide an amount of the debt on the itemized date. They don't have to provide an itemization of interest fees, payments, and credits since itemization date. <clears throat> Form of validation information. Validation information must be clear and conspicuous. Earlier, I spoke about the Safe Harbor Act. A debt collector that uses the model validation notice complies with the required information and format, satisfies the clear and conspicuous requirement, does not overshadow rights to dispute request original credit information. Safe Harbor still applies if the collector includes, excludes optional content discussed infra, uses separate page for itemization, or periodic mortgage statement uses a substantially similar form. So this is, they're being very specific on mortgages. So <clears throat> if you want to learn more about the mortgage, I would highly recommend you write this down, 1006.34D1 and 1006.38D2. And this is going to give you more information on the debt validation as it uh, pertains to mortgages. So uh, <clears throat> take that down, go onto the CFPB website and just get that part going. All right. <clears throat> Substantially similar. Permissible changes to the model notice include using the name of the deceased rather than you when collected um, descendant debt from an estate representative. Relocating the consumer response information to facilitate mailing, adding barcodes or QR codes, adding the date the form is generated, embedding hyperlinks if delivered if delivered electronically, <clears throat> a debt collector that makes these modifications is still entitled to the safe harbor. So they're saying now that they can add QR codes, barcodes, put hyperlinks, like they can do a lot of stuff now and they're still covered under the safe harbor act. <clears throat> so optional. Validation information. This is important that y'all get this. 
optional, meaning they don't have to do this. Optional disclosures. <clears throat> it's optional. They don't have to give you their phone number. It's optional. They don't have to give you a reference code if their business uses a reference code. It's optional if they say contact us about your payment options or on the response form, I enclose this amount. It is optional. Disclosures under applicable law. It's optional for them to give you their website and email address. It is optional how to dispute or request original creditor information electronically. You notice it says electronically. It doesn't go for paper mail. Paper mail is mandatory. Electronically, it's optional. And this is where now you as the consumer need to be very specific in saying that, hey, I want all, well, first of all, let's start like this. Cease and desist all manner of communication except the United States Postal Services. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna give y'all a little trick. Did y'all know that there's a difference between the United States Post Office and the United States Postal Services? I just found this out recently. Under the Post Office, So if you all notice <clears throat> these, like letters, when you get letters, they don't have a stamp. They don't have a stamp on them anymore. These are being sent through the postal service. The post office, you must have a stamp. This is how they're getting around mail fraud. If it didn't go through the post office, it's not mail fraud. Like, are y'all getting what I'm saying? There's no stamp. There's no stamp anymore because they're using a contracting company called the United States Postal Services. The United Postal Services is a company of the United States Post Office. The Post Office and the Postal Service is two different things. So you want to say, I want all correspondence sent through the United States Post Office. And if it doesn't come through the Post Office and has a stamp on there, you know that they use the postal services and then they can get around mail fraud. That's how they're getting around mail fraud because they're not using the Post Office. You think because the post, the guy that works for the post office delivers it, it's coming through the post office. No, it's going through their postal service. Totally different thing. So I just wanted to throw that out there. That's why there's no stamps on there. Because you know, when you go to the post office, you have to put a stamp on there. So why isn't their correspondence have a stamp on it? That's how they're getting around mail fraud. <clears throat> optional disclosures under applicable law. Because let me be this horse somewhere. <clears throat> Can you prove that they send this to you? Like, is there any way, let me bring it a little closer. See, there's a window, there's a window and there's no stamp. It's not addressed to anybody. This is just a medium of transport. So you can't go to court and say, this was sent to me. How? Prove it. You can't. Your name isn't on there. It's not on there. They use a window. They can simply say, you got that. So y'all got to be re like, they're getting really slick. They're getting extremely slick and you got to be on top of the beat with them. Right? So optional disclosures under applicable law. Disclosures under applicable law. On the reverse side, disclosures required by law <clears throat> are that provide safe harbor under applicable law. On the fund side, I notice that disclosures are on the back. So if there's disclosures on the back, they need to tell you where these disclosures are. It needs to be conspicuous. If collecting time bar debt, a time bar debt disclosures required by 
or that provides a safe harbor under applicable law. <clears throat> Electronic validation notice. Collector may. So you notice now the words change. <clears throat> when it comes to the electronic part of it, it's optional now, right? So this is saying a collector may turn prompts into fillable fields to dispute the debt or request original creditor information and close payments request a Spanish validation notice. So <clears throat> if the consumer speaks and comprehend a different language and the consumer makes a request that the correspondence be in that language, they must send it in that language because if the consumer don't comprehend the contents of the message of the correspondence, then it is not reasonable. You can't, I, I'm, I speak English, you can't send me something written in Mandarin or Chinese and I don't know Chinese a day in my life and I'm supposed to comprehend it. That doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> All right, so right here, translation into other languages. So a collector may send a translated validation notice if translation is complete and, oh, let me take this out, and accurate, provides an English, provides an English language validation notice in the same communication or in a prior communication. Collector must send Spanish validation notice if included an optional disclosure about how to request a Spanish language translation. So like I said, if the client speaks Spanish, they can, they have the right to request it in Spanish. Consumer made a request for the translated disclosure. Um, safe Harbor for language obtained from the CFPB website. CFPB plans to add Spanish before the rule is effective and may add other languages later. So <clears throat> they're becoming more diverse. Not everybody reads English. Not everybody English is their first language. So now they're making provisions to facilitate these other languages. Um, take this part out. So other provisions on language access, and they're just going more now in requesting the communication, the language, initial disclosures, that the debt collector is attempting to collect the debt and that any information obtained will be used for that purpose and subsequent disclosures that the communication is from a debt collector must be made in the same language, language is used for the rest of the communication. So if they start in Spanish, they can switch it to English or Mandarin. It needs to be all the way through in the exact language. So method to dispute, uh, to dispute request original creditor info. A dispute or original creditor info request has been submitted in writing if sent by mail, return consumer response from, sent via electronic communication, used by collector to accept consumer communication delivered in person or via career service. Deceased consumer and disputes. If the collector knows or knows, wait, if the collector knows or should know the consumer is deceased and consumer did not previously dispute the debt, or request original creditor information, it must respond to the timely dispute or request for original creditor information made by a person authorized to act on behalf of the deceased consumer's estate. <clears throat> so like I said, they can't just, um, one second. They can't just 
pick any random person and send them the correspondence or saying that, you know, you are liable. No, you, they must find whoever is authorized to act on behalf of the deceased consumer. It's very important. So. All right, so now <clears throat> I'm going to open up now for Q&A. So let's see. Yeah, so um if you want, you should have the ability to unmute yourself. So now we can go into um, we can go into some correspondence. Well, not correspondence. We can now go into some um, tennis. So let's go into some Q and A's. Raise your hands, and then we'll get that part going. Um, Cash, I see your hand is up first. Um, unmute yourself, and um, let's let's kick it off. Um, first, I wanted to check if Nisha or Bear was able to come on. Yeah, I need to check that too. I didn't get a chance to do that. Okay, no problem. And then my second question, which I did put in the chat, so I would not forget, had to do with um, the timeline on responses, right? So if they don't send it certified mail, they can't prove that you got it, correct? And they can't prove that they sent it to you. Well, that's one part. The, the law didn't say, it didn't say they have to prove that you got it. It must be sent. So now the burden of proof now is on them. So if they don't do what they're supposed to do, yeah, I don't see Nish on here. If they don't do what they're supposed to do to send it, and not only that, to being able to prove that it, excuse me, that it was sent. The burden of proof is now on them. So not because they sent something, it means, oh, I sent it. No, guilty upon proof of claim. So if you say you sent it, prove that you sent it. Where is the tracking number? Where is the green return receipt? Okay, so then with dealing with clients and telling them about like the 30 days um, to respond, shouldn't that generally be for certified mail? Say that again. So we were talking about um, talking to our clients, making sure they stay on top of their mail because we want to get everything done in either the 14 or 30 day window. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we emphasize that's really for certified mail because if they send it regular we can just say we never got it well you're talking about sending back the undeliverability um either sending back the undeliverability or responding in general okay so when you respond you always want to respond certified mail green return receipt <clears throat> so you need to be able to prove your claim but if you're sending back a correspondence under the premise now that um, you're returning it to sender, you cannot send it certified mail anymore. No, so if my client gets a letter and I instruct them to let me know every time they get mail, mm -hmm. scan it for me, we're gonna respond. Isn't my response a confirmation of receipt? Yeah, if you respond to it, correct, you are correct. So then another way could be, if it's not certified, we'll just say we didn't get it. Never got it. Because remember, you know, they're sending, you're sending the letters like these. It's being sent like this. The question now becomes, did you actually get it? It's like this. You can't prove who, can any of you prove that this was sent to me? Can anybody right now on this prove that this was sent to me? You cannot. My name is not here. But we are getting the habit 
of thinking that every time these correspondents come to us, they're talking to us. They're not talking to you. They're not. Because first of all, you need to prove that you sent it. I'm guilty upon proof of claim without dishonor. So if you're saying that I got it, okay, guy, prove that I got it. Prove that I got it. So right now, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Y'all can check it out. Um, I got a few ebooks that um, I, it's going to be tremendous help to y'all. So y'all can go through the funnel and look at it. It's great information that's in there. But <clears throat> the biggest thing is proof of claim. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. Proof of claim. That's why the whole validation section is there. Proof of claim. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I know I've seen a lot of questions in the chat, Shakira. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for this during. This no awesome. problem. Um, I had a few questions, um, but I can just stick to the one. Now that you're holding up that easy pass, I'm actually trying to go through, um, how would you address that if you did get it? Because I mean, I sent um, a letter out actually, I'm just for me, not for clients. Um, I sent out a letter basically telling them that they violated my rights um, in regards to using my credit card without permission. Because they, when they ran my uh, license plate mm -hmm. without a, perma, a permissible purpose um, and you know, so I, I was actually, how, how do you address that when you get those, um, if you don't mind me asking? So I've gotten those before and I used a very similar way to what you just said. I, what I did was <coughs> I built a letter based on that part um, using my credit card in which I received no benefit. And what I saw happen was they sent it to collections and it's been there. They've called many times, but it's been going a year now and I haven't seen it on the report yet. I'm waiting for them to put it on there. Mm, okay, thank you. Because remember, you know, the minute you accept and you make payment, you now just accepted the trust that they created. Because mm -hmm. everything is a trust, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's a trust. Um, if I say, you know, you owe me and you says, okay, I do. You now just confirm that you do. So now by obligation, you now are obligated to perform. So when they send these notices and then they want to take people to court, all right, let's go, motherfucker shit, let's go. Because now you need to prove it. You said you sent me correspondences. I never received any. Show me the correspondence that you sent. I never received any. So if I don't receive them, how can I respond to something that I've never seen? I'm not a magician. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you. My other question I had put in the chat, um, I don't know if anybody else has a question. It was just, um, cause I'm trying to learn like this law stuff too, but when they, when they send the letter to you, right? And it's all uppercase letter, they're sending it to your straw man, not necessarily the consumer. So when you're disputing that, is that true or is that not true? It is true. So. A corporation cannot speak to a natural person. Okay. A dead entity cannot speak to a natural person. <coughs> I'm gonna give you an example. Um, <clears throat> the mandate, right? You noticed it didn't say they mandated the citizens. They didn't mandate the citizen. They mandated the corporations. I want y'all to follow me. They didn't mandate the citizens. They mandated the corporations, but the people that worked for these corporations now are in a binding contract with these corporations now that they have to perform under the guidance of these corporations. And the other thing too that I want to mention, do not call yourselves citizens because a citizen is a corporation. A citizen is a thing. A citizen is not a natural person. 
the citizen falls under the United States. The United States is a federal corporation. America is a country. The United States is a corporation and it has citizens. So when we start comprehending these different terminologies, now you really know how to operate. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I'm sure people got more questions. Come on, guys, come on. This is FDCPA. Hey, I'm going to ask a question for Jonathan. He said he can't uh, respond right now because he has noise in the background, but he did type it in the chat. He's asking if this recording going to be available to us later. Say again, please. He's asking if this recording going to be available later. Yeah, so oh, I'll yeah. make the recording available, but it will be on the website. So when I get that all situated, I'll let y'all know. But this was something that's kind of outside of the whole thing, the recession proof, because um, even though this is a recession proof Zoom, you know, it's not the Zoom like what Marcus does. It's a little different. It was just to bring enlightenment on the new changes because I want everybody to start using the new laws. And when you not get results using the old information, this could be the reason why people are still using old information. So it's time you update your information, update your letters, because the letters are key. The language is key. So what I'll do is I'll create a funnel later on, and I'll be able to send you all the link for the funnel where you all be able to get the Zoom. So I'm going to make an assumption that 80 or 90% of everyone on here has um, a credit repair business. Or if you don't have it, you intend to get one. And I know a lot of people on here also use this CRC. And <clears throat> so let's talk about letters, right? The correspondence, the information in the correspondence is what gets you results. When you talk about, please, this is not mine, this account has the same name as my parent, all of that stuff, that stuff does not work. You need to be using straight laws. There is a law for every single thing. And <clears throat> in my mentorship, this is one of the things I teach. I have one guy right now, in the past, two months, 19, 10, five and five. He has deleted 40 collections, 40, four zero in the last, I think in the last month and a half to two months. He's gotten over 40 collections deleted. Guys have gotten late payments deleted. I keep, late payments are illegal. Utilizations are illegal, but not until you comprehend the language that is used. Not until you comprehend the language that is being used, that they use, because remember now, it's not your language, it is their language. <clears throat> so how do you respond? You respond in kind using their own language. Don't make shit up, use their own language. And this is where consumer law comes in because consumer laws are made. It is the language that is used. It's the language. This is why the comprehension of the language is so critical. Because under the law, the information being reported must maintain maximum accuracy. It's important. Stop using the word remove. <clears throat> the FCRA doesn't speak on removing item, it speaks on deleting. So why are you gonna use words that are not there? Use the words that you're using. Why is it important? 
because when it's their own words, there is no going around it. This is your words. Come on, give me some more questions. Uh, Fred, what's going on, brother? What's going on, brother? So, oh, bro, let's go. Man, I've been watching you for a minute. I see you doing a lot of great things, dropping a lot of gems, YouTube going crazy. I'm learning a lot from you, just studying and stuff, man. Appreciate it, bro. And um, now what I wanted to ask, I see you talk about the late payments and stuff like that. So when you drafting a letter uh, for a client in regards to the late payments, do you, um, like, how would you basically say that it's like basically saying, oh, this is not supposed to be on due to, you know, it being- That's a, a great question. I got you. I'm going to pull up one of my late payment letters. I'm going to go through it right now. <clears throat> That's a great question. <laughs> Let me go find my letters. All right, you said you wanted to know about late payments, right, Fred? I got more questions, but I'm gonna start with, I just wanna start with the late payments. Uh, all right, cool, let me find late payments. Where do I have it? All right, let me know if y'all can see my screen. Can y'all see it? Yeah. Okay, and you're seeing dealing with late payments, right? Yeah, I see it. Yes. All right, bet. <clears throat> so this is so I don't encourage nobody to use the letters inside a credit repair cloud because the let and this is no disrespect, but the letters are trash. They're really trash. So when we're talking about a late payment, we're not talking about a goodwill adjustment letter. We don't need that. That is actual crap as well. So what I teach, right? <clears throat> Consumer law secrets. This is where we're going in with straight laws. And I'm gonna show you right now. I'm gonna prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that a late payment is illegal. I am willing to put up a hundred dollars that I will prove to you that the late payment is illegal. Do you accept? I accept. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> to whom it may concern, I recently received a copy of my consumer report, right? This should be consumer report. Don't know why credit report is here, but it should be consumer report. Consumer report. And I noticed some late payments posted on my credit report. Should be consumer report. Right. So right here, you would list the name of the accounts with the late payments. Your company is in clear violation of the law. So 15 U.S.C. 1681B, permissible purpose. But that's not what the meat of the matter is. The meat of the matter is down here. So right now, if you take your phone out and you go to 15 U.S.C. 1681A2, right, it's going to show you that the exclusion section says, except as provided in paragraph three, the term consumer report does not include. Now, what does the word does not include mean? Fred, talk to me. Wait, say that again? What does the word 
does not include me. Does not include me, not supposed to be there. Not supposed to be there, right? Good. Yeah. So <clears throat> let me do this, then we'll go back to the letter. I want you to see it on the law itself. So now we're in Google. Let me new share. Google. So now we're going to go to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right? So 15 USC 1681. Boom. <clears throat> Brings us to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Now we're going to go to definitions 1681A. Number two, except as provided in paragraph three, the term consumer report does not include. A1, report containing information solely as to transactions or experiences between the consumer and the person making the report. I want you to talk to me now, Fred. <laughs> Congress okay. is telling you that the consumer report does not include report containing solely as to transaction. What is your transaction? Mm -hmm. Isn't that your payment history? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. All right. The experience is your utilization. If you have a line of credit for $10,000 and you use $5,000, that is your experience with that line of credit. Yes? Yeah. yeah. So if Congress says, except as provided in paragraph three, the term consumer report does not include mm -hmm. report containing information solely as to transactions or experiences between the consumer. Who's the consumer? You. I am the consumer. Yeah, right. Who is the person? Well, Doreen, I'm glad you asked that because now we're going to go into definitions because we need to comprehend what definitions mean. So Congress gives you the definition. The term consumer means an individual, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then Congress says person means. The term person means any individual, comma, partnership, comma, corporation, mm -hmm. comma, trust, estate, cooperative association, government, or governmental subdivision. So your Capital One, your Wells Fargo, aren't those corporations? Yeah. So by definition, yeah. they are a person, yes? Yeah. Okay, so Congress says now, except as provided in paragraph three, the term consumer report does not include report containing information solely as to transactions or experiences between the consumer and the person making the report. Where does the late payment or utilization come from? Wow, okay. <laughs> It's a whole fraud, bro. It is fraud out the ass. No. Crazy. Okay, so but yeah, so I mean, based on that in the verbiage that you put the letter in, that so hold on, hold on. So if that's the case, right? Okay, so do you just would you on an open account, right? You see how the utilization is on there, and they tell you it's thirty percent. That's you that's can all. get that deleted too. <clears throat> Remember, you know, there's a difference. So the utilization and the late payment are factors in your credit score, not your consumer report. There's a difference between your consumer report and your credit, um, your credit score. Those are two separate things. Your credit score is generated by Fear Isaacs Corporation. Right. They have it is not your consumer report. Your consumer report is housed in the consumer reporting agencies. What they've done is merge the two together. So you think that the credit score is a part of your consumer report. It is not. The factors that make up the consumer report, not the consumer report, the factors that make up your credit score has nothing to do with your consumer report. The information 
from your consumer report is used to calculate your credit score. So when it comes to the credit score, it is a factor. But if I take that factor and delete it from my consumer report, which then generates my credit score, 800, baby. Mm, wow. So basically, um, on the report itself, the lenders are not supposed to see any of that. The late nope. payments, the units, none of that stuff. Nope. So when they talk about, uh, so when they talk about like your DTI mm -hmm. and stuff That's like that. That's fake news too. All of that is fake news. And it's fake news for the simple fact <clears throat> that if you allow them to do it, they will do it. Yeah. But when you put your correspondences yeah. together yeah. and you go to them and you, so in this case, right? With the late payment, you're not directing the late payments to the consumer reporting agencies. You're going straight to the person. So if it's Wells Fargo, you're going directly to Wells Fargo. And you're, so the letter. Hold on, so just quick question. So with the late payment, right? When you putting it on the report, you're just re just putting. Uh, let's say you have five late payments on that account, right? Are you listing all five of when it was reported late, or just one? Remember, you know, you're sending it to the person. Right. So if you have five so the, different companies, you're not going to send all five on the same letter. Each one is going to be directed specifically to that to company. that specific company, right? Yeah. Got no, but what I'm saying is, do you put every month that you were late on there? Like every, uh... Yeah, so you what you want to do is identify all the late payments. So if it's Capital One, every late payment that you've ever had with them, you're going to identify them when it happened. Them. Yep, okay. and you're going to put them on there. Yep. Got it, got you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. <clears throat> Let me find my late payment two letter. Uh, where is it? Good stuff. Quick question, please, Daron. Um, thank you for all the information. Um, returning to the late payments, how do they normally like resist? Like, how does it go? How does the process go when you've done it? Well, With you're not supposed to know this, so <clears throat> they're going to resist. But the law is the law. So now <clears throat> I'm looking for something. Give me one second. I'm going to find it for you. And then I'm going to go through it. <clears throat> All right. All right, so can y'all see the screen? Yeah. All right, so let's go through this. <clears throat> this now should give y'all a bit of grasp of the whole concept of the late payment. Um, I recently received a copy of my experience TransUnion consumer report and I noticed and I noticed some late payments posted on the report. So Fred, this right here now is where you would list the late payments and you would put the dates that they occurred, right, right in this part. Call them. Got it. Your company is in clear violation of the law. 15, person 15 USC 1681A2, A1. Right? So now, what we're saying is this, <laughs> exclusion, except as provided in paragraph three, the term consumer report does not include, subject to subsection A, um, 1681 S3 of this title, report containing information solely as to transactions 
or experiences between the consumer and the person making the report. So if you notice, I highlight and I color code it because I want them to zone in on these parts. So the law clearly states transactions between the consumer, me, and the person, you, so you'd put their name here, Capital One, Wells Fargo, whoever, making the report is not included in my consumer report. That is clear. A late payment is a transactional history, my history with your company. Congress clearly states that the report of transaction or experiences between the consumer and the person making the report is not included on a consumer report. You have violated the FCRA 15 USC 1681A21 by reporting this transaction or experience on my consumer report. Congress clearly states it is not included on my consumer report. You have 10 calendar days to update my payment history and to delete all late payments from the below accounts. So now you would list the accounts again. So you list them up here, but you also list them down here again. So now I'm doubling back now. Failure to respond satisfactory with deletion of the above late payments will result in legal action being taken against your company for which I will also be seeking $1,000 per violation for defamation, um, negligence. But you can take this a step further, right? Because when we go to the Fair Credit Reporting Act and we now talk about the civil liability section, let me pull that part up. Share. So when we pull this part up, right, and we now talk about civil liability, <clears throat> I know a lot of people think that, you know, you can only get paid $1,000 per violation. That is not true. You can get paid more than $1,000. Any person who willfully fails to comply with any requirement imposed under the subchapter with respect to any consumer is liable to that consumer in an amount equal to the sum up. So any actual damage, do y'all know what this means? This part means, wait, let me finish it first before I explain that. Is that like, oh, you say you go. Yeah, any actual damage is sustained by the consumer as a result of the failure or damages of not less than $100 and not more than $1,000. Or in the case of liability of a natural person for obtaining a consumer report under false pretenses, not only without a permissible purpose, actual damage sustained by the consumer as a result of the failure, whichever is greater. Now, so that, like, um, I remember you mentioned this before somewhere else. Is it like if you if you try to apply for something and then you you got denied as a result of the late payment of the failure, yeah, yeah. sexual damages, correct? So whatever that amount was, no, you now see it's written in law. You are entitled to that amount that you got damaged for actual damages over a thousand dollars. But Congress says whichever is greater. So if your actual damages is greater, that's what you're gonna get. Hold on. So let me get this straight. Let me, I just wanna be clear. So let's say you, I don't know, you, you wanna get some real estate, right? And you, the, the property was, let's say 90,000, right? And you, you were denied because of your report and them failing to, I mean, them, them reporting things that's not accurate and stuff like that. And you now file a lawsuit with company. Is it for that the amount that you were gonna uh, for that ninety thousand? Mm -hmm. The whole thing. <clears throat> so when people get denied for home loans because of stuff on the consumer report that is inaccurate, 
and not complete, they don't know that that $500,000 for approval, that a million dollar, they're entitled to that if they take these companies to court. Wow. It's not just on the investment side, any actual damage. So if I was going for a home loan right now and I got denied because of what's on my credit and I can prove without a shadow of a doubt that I told them it was incorrect, that it was inaccurate, I gave them an, an opportunity to cure and they willfully were non-compliant. That's a whole band right there. Oh, shit. Consumer law is different than anything else. Metro 2 is great. Factual dispute is great. Consumer laws, you can get paid. Seriously. This is why I teach this. And this is why the mentorship is the, like, it's not tooting my own horn, but I got the best consumer law mentorship out there. I don't care what nobody says. <laughs> the things we go into, bro. Like yesterday, I just learned how to discharge a whole car note. What? Like delete the whole car note. Mm -hmm. Just, I'm going to give it 30 days. And when it works, it's, my mentorship price is going to be different. Because now we're not just talking about deleting stuff off the consumer report anymore. We're talking about deleting the whole debt altogether, zeroing it out. All right, um, I know I went into the rabbit hole of the FCRA, even though we were supposed to be doing only FDCPA. Listen, <clears throat> I am going to D-A-R-A-I-N-E. I am going to drop the link to my website in the chat. I'm telling y'all, go on the website, join the mentorship. It's a whole different ball game. Also, um, Seven had his hand up for a minute. Seven, let's go. Let's go, bro. Question about how, to, how can we use consumer law for child support? So, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, um, it was, it was Natalie. She was asking, um, how can you use consumer law for child support? We have a client for uh, uh, that we have a business credit that we're doing a one-on-one -on -one with. And mm -hmm. he has child support uh, payment. I think it's child support derogatory. So child, his, support, um, child support is the biggest fraud. I'm working on the child support deletion guide. I'm going to make it a point of duty. <clears throat> so I just dropped the link to the mentorship in the chat. I'm going to make mm -hmm. it a point of duty to finish the child support deletion guide by next week. Child support is the biggest fraud. And I'm going to show you all. Oh. Because you. the original intention of child support is not to benefit the custodial parent. It's to benefit the United States Treasury. But I'll prove that to you all when I make the, charge, um, the child support deletion guide. It, it's, a, it's a fraudulent system. It is so fraud. So I'll be, I'm, I'm gonna make sure I get that done within the next week to two weeks. Um, Shamika still has her hand up. Was your question answered or did you have other questions? Um, and then in terms of the question in the chat, the replay will be made available soon on the website. Yes, Cash. Um, yeah, I had um, a question, Doreen. What about like, um, for instance, your building reporting your rent um to your consumer report without your permission like it's not a credit card but they're going for another company or i think or be send, or them or cease, like that. send them a cease and desist <clears throat> you're gonna send them a cease and desist person 15 usc 1681 b2 under permissible purpose so you're gonna have a permissible purpose letter built out but the title you're going to have cease and desist reporting of my information without my permission in bold letters highlighted. Okay, and then with the law in it? 
Yes. So on the website, I have a letter for permissible purpose. You can get that letter. If you go on the website and you go to all products, can you all see the screen? Yes. So when you go, if you go to all products, um, you're going to see all the letters there. <clears throat> so you can click this to go to the deletion letters and it's going <clears> to... <throat> It's going to show you all the letters that's there. In your case, Shamika, you want this letter, the permissible purpose letter. But what you will do now is you will just reword this with a cease and desist of them reporting your information without your permission. Okay. Because this is built generally, you would now have to um, change the language to suit your situation. Okay. Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. Um, I see Jamarcus. Jamarcus, can you unmute? Oh yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Hey, I just wanted to uh, ask a question, man. I appreciate all the knowledge. Uh, I actually, I'm tapping in from Houston. Um, part of the Houston up. chapter. I appreciate you. Absolutely, sir. So uh, I don't know if you want to get with me like uh, personally about this, but I pretty much, you know, your letters look fantastic, man. Um, a lot of the verbiage on that, um, especially like with the, uh, the per se, like um, the defamation of character and et cetera about that. But like I, I, did, a, I did a claim to the CFPB I don't know if I need to keep going and do one for the BBB and the attorney general, mm -hmm. but basically like they closed my case and was like, you know, they, they responded with some crap. They closed, sorry about the kids in the background. Oh, they, uh, they closed my case, man. And, uh, you know, all them threats now, I guess now they got to come to life, but I don't, I don't have any like resources as far as legal, legal advice or legal help. If you know what I mean? Like I'm already there with it. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the major things is this. you can always go pro se, meaning learn how to do it yourself. But um, when it comes to court, I see because I don't give legal advice. And when it comes to court, right, right. that is borderline in giving legal advice. But what I do recommend is finding a consumer lawyer. Okay. What that does is everything that you're going to learn in the mentorship, right? Learning how to spot the deletions, learning how to get the violations, learning how to identify the violations. When you put it together, you're going to make it so much easier now when you go to the consumer lawyer, because all they have to do is show up and represent. You know everything that needs to get done. You've shown the violation. You showed the notices that you gave them that the information was incorrect that is inaccurate, you show them that you gave them an, an opportunity to cure the default or to cure the incorrect, inaccurate information. And then you can now prove that they willfully was non-compliant. Mm, and under okay. law, it says for willful non-compliance, you are owed your remedy. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, okay, excellent. Yeah, I just thought I, I had a misunderstanding that like the CFPB, like they was trying to come in and, you know bro, what I'm saying, handle everything. You're trash, bro. Like, yeah. they had backbone before, but now it's different. So what I tell my mentees, so there's two parts to the CFPB. There's the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, but there's also the Bureau of Consumer Protection Finance. There's two parts to it. So what I tell my mentees is you direct the complaint to the FTC and you CC the Bureau of uh, Consumer Protection Finance under. So the FTC now sends it over to the Bureau. I see what you're saying. The CFPB is trash. They're administrative and they're, they're just trash, bro. Okay. Okay. All right, family. I appreciate that. Anytime, King. Anytime. Thank you. Duran, can I ask you one more question? You can ask me whatever you want. Let's go. <laughs> okay, I have a question. So I've been trying to learn this law stuff and I started the process, like a private administrative process. I did, um, and I got through it. But if you missed the 30-day window, do you have to start over? 
like I did, I gave him actually the last one was um the notice of default. That one, the um, the, I don't know off the top of my head. Something to cure. I have it in my note, my thing. I should know it off the top of my head, but I don't. And I sent it, and they had ten days to respond, and they didn't. And I did, and it's been more than the ten days, but I had to start the process over again. How far from the ten days? I would say like at least five, five to six days past the. No, so you would write them another correspondence, and basically what you're going to tell them is, I gave you an opportunity to respond within this time frame. By you not responding in this time frame, your silence is acquiescence. You agree that everything that was sent in my previous correspondence is true. So it's really about how you word it. So in the first communication, you wanna put that in there. You wanna put, if you don't respond in this time, your silence is acquiescent that you agree to everything in here. And by you agreeing to everything in here, this, 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 and this is gonna happen. It's really about how you structure it. So you could go back with a follow-up or um, you could just restructure the language and then go again. Okay. The language. Okay. You, um, you send all of those out certified, correct? I didn't hear you, King. What you say? Mail all of those out certified. Always, always certified mail green return receipt. You want to get them notarized Mommy. and maintain Mommy. a copy. So when you go, you get them notarized and you keep a copy. So you'd print out two copies. One, you keep for yourself, for your records, one that gets mailed out. The notary signs them and you keep it because these are going to be your exhibits should you have to take legal action. Mm, okay. Notaries are extremely powerful. Okay, okay thank you. You're absolutely welcome. <clears throat> I don't see any more questions. Cash, there was a uh, question in the chat. Somebody was asking to touch on bankruptcies. Oh, the chat. You know, I have not been paying attention to the chat. All right. Um, okay, yeah, I see someone asked if you can touch on bankruptcies. I want everyone to know um, Zerain, he's on Clubhouse Weekly on Fridays. Um, and that's also another way to tap in with him. Not as much access as a mentorship, but just so you guys know. Now, bankruptcy is a whole nother Zoom in itself. <clears throat> the first thing I want y'all to know is, <clears throat> as a consumer, you have what is called your right to privacy. Um, the reporting of a bankruptcy is a breach of that right of your right to privacy and your privacy is private for you. So in, um, there's two things you can do for bankruptcy. Um, I have a bankruptcy deletion guide here on the website, but there's also a way for you to get the bankruptcy ebook. If you go to ebook series on the, if you go to the website, and you go to ebook series, it's going to bring you to a special link that I have on YouTube. And basically, what this does is you're able to get the bankruptcy ebook, um, three ebooks for $47. So it's only available in this, in this, um, in this offer. But if you want the whole guide. And what the whole guide is, it has the audio, the video book of me breaking down the whole bankruptcy. But not only that, it has the bankruptcy letters and it also has the video and the webinar explaining the bankruptcy. So if you go here, you can actually get the bankruptcy. Even though you see an ebook here, you're getting a whole course on bankruptcy. It's a whole course, letters, eBooks, and webinar, breaking down the whole process of bankruptcy. Um, As a student at, in the mentorship, you get 
all of those? Yeah, so everything that you see on the website, everything you see on the website is in the mentorship. And the great thing about the mentorship is if a product is created outside the, 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 the bundle that you bought or the products that you bought, you're able to get that other product at 50% off. So let's say for instance, you join the mentorship and the child support deletion guide isn't there yet because I haven't made it yet and you got it. Now, when the child support deletion guide becomes available, you will now, being a mentee, get an opportunity to get it for 50% off when everybody else got to pay full price. I see another question in the chat. I just want to run it by you to see if I answered it right. Someone asked, do the letters go to the creditor certified? Um, and I said, yes, every time you're sending to companies, you want it certified so you can mm -hmm. prove you sent it and someone got it on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, someone also asked if you have a rebook on repossessions. Yes, I do have a repossession guide. It is so <clears throat> everything you can possibly think of, everything, I've made a guide for it. <clears throat> Anything that has to do with credit. So this repossession, so repossession is one of my most favorite things. You can get paid off a repossession. A lot of people don't know you can run up a serious bag off a repossession. Repossession is handled a little differently because how we have the FCRA and um, the FDCPA, when it comes to repossession, we're under Article 9, Part 6. So UCC 9, Part 6, that's the section of the law that deals with repossession. Repossession is a whole mood, and I love repossession. So if you go to the website and you go to the repossession bundle, you will be able to get the webinar, the letters, and everything that comes with the repossession. I love repossession. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Christian, I see your hand is up. Christian's iPhone. Well, real quick, in the meantime, um, I don't know if people just saw in the chat, I dropped that all major banks usually have notaries um, and usually for free. That's not, I didn't know that until some, some guy went into TD Bank and I was like, wow. Yeah, they do. <laughs> you just say you have an account with them. And some you don't have to have an account with. I did ask that as well. But yeah, but you, TD, yeah. I think they don't do power of attorney because I went to do one the other day and they don't sign power of attorneys. Interesting. And someone said if you have triple A, it's free too. Um, one more try for Christian's iPhone. Are you here? Yeah, um, my question real quick is, um, so does that mean um, now you don't have to um, send a message, um, letters to the CEOs again? Say that again? Um, so does it mean uh, for the late payments, you don't have to um, send letters to the CEOs no more? Well, I'm not sure what you mean. What do you mean? He's saying so um, you don't have to necessarily send a letter to the CEO of a company. Oh, why would you not? Because listen, <clears throat> notice the principal is notice the agent. Notice the agent is notice the principal. So whether you find your registered agent or you send it to the CFO, CEO, whoever it is. It doesn't matter who gets it. Once you put on there, notice to agent is notice to principal, notice to principal is notice to agent. That's not your problem. You sent it. Whoever receives it, receives it. Get me oh. what I want or I'm coming after you. And in, in that expression, principal is what? The principal will be the head of the company. Mm. So it doesn't matter if their no. if their um if their registered agent gets the letter. That's not your problem. All Just right. know that whoever receives it in that company, any agent, anybody that works there, it is noticed that the principal also received it. So you can go hard like that on the CEO. Is that what you mean? 
Oh, 100%. You can send it directly to them. You can send it to the CFO, like wherever you want to send it. But just know, notice the agent is notice the principal. Notice the principal is notice the agent. And some people send to like the council or the compliance department as well. Mm -hmm. But as long as you have that verbiage there, it doesn't matter who gets it. Everybody in that chain of command should be notified. That's what that's what exactly what you're saying. All right, thank you. We have one more question. Do we have to use power of attorney when doing this for clients? So that part's a little tricky. Um, <clears throat> depends on what you're doing. So what you can do is prepare the documents, right? <clears throat> You can prepare the documents, have them sign it, have them go to the notary and get that part done. And when they do, they send it back to you and you mail it off. But if you want to go down the route of power of attorney, you can do that as well. See, I like the path of least resistance. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make the letter, I'm going to do everything. Go get the shit notarized and bring it back. That's just me. I want the path of least resistance. <clears throat> I don't see any more questions. Um, if you could drop your Instagram in the chat and then your website one more time so that people know how to get in contact with you. Instagram. Let me find that thing. And I just want to say thank you so much. This Zoom was fire. I knew it would be. Um, always dropping gems. I appreciate, Allison, I appreciate y'all coming on. Definitely appreciate y'all coming on because the Zooms turn. Let me find this damn link. It's okay, I'll do it one second. <laughs> See me over here struggling. I do, I do. <laughs> oh, there it is at the top. <clears throat> Boom, catch this. Drop it in the chat. Where is the chat? All right. So this is my Instagram. And then now for the website. Oh, and before I go, um, let's talk about briefly about um, your businesses because you it's not your business can't just be service based. Make sure that y'all have your ebooks ready. So I just drop in the chat my Instagram. Definitely give me a follow. I'll follow back. And the website, if you're interested in the mentorship, you'll see the button for the mentorship and you'll see the button for all the products. You can get the letters. You can get your bankruptcy deletion guide, the repossession deletion guide. Whatever you want is there. Like everything is there. It's like a one-stop shop for credit. And all the products are consumer law based every single thing is consumer law based 100 percent um <clears throat> i've been saying this and i've been saying it a lot <clears throat> you have to have digital products along with your credit repair business it's important that you have digital products with your credit repair business it gives you an opportunity to educate your clients and it makes it easier to deal with them when they comprehend what you're doing. But not only that, you're also able to make additional streams of income. Your digital products are mandatory. It is key to you making sleep money. You need your digital product. You need your website. You need your funnels. These things are important. 
If you want to make a hundred thousand a month, two hundred thousand a month, three hundred, like these are the things that are selling when you're sleeping. It's important that y'all get these things situated. Because what if you're not able to provide a service? What does that mean? You're not going to make any money? If you're not able to fix somebody's report, what does that mean? Are you not going to get paid? It's important that your digital products are made. It is important that your digital products are on your website. It is important that you have your digital products set up so people can purchase when you are asleep and you make that additional stream of income. It is very important. So with that being said, <clears throat> it's been an amazing Zoom. Listen, when y'all go back, go back and spread the word. Um, go back and spread the word. Oh, I see my guy Xavier is here. Xavier, are you are you able to speak? I guess he's busy. Um, it's it's really important that y'all have y'all products set up. It's very important because you need that sleep money. You need your products selling when you are when you are not available when you're when you're sleeping. <clears throat> Everybody on this call right now should be working on y'all ebooks. Everybody. Credit is the foundation of everything that we do. You can, you can have so much more with credit than you can with anything else. Don't sleep on the digital products. I'm telling you, the digital products are key. I promise you, I'm not here lying to nobody. <clears throat> the digital products that's selling itself when you're not there providing a service is key. Spend the time, make your ebook, spend the time and have it ready. The offer you don't make is the offer they can take. Make more offers. And you will see how you're gonna have a tremendous change in your business. So that is all I have for today. Well, it's not all I have. I got a ton more stuff, but <clears throat> this was just FDCPA. And this is probably one of the shortest Zooms I've ever done. It's like what, two hours and 13 minutes. Yeah, this is short. My Zooms normally go for seven, eight hours. This is short. So I'm glad this is a short Zoom. I'm not used to holding short Zooms like this. So it's like, oh shit, what do I do with myself now? I'm gonna go study some shit. But um, yeah. These, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to. My throat feels weird too. So I'm gonna go get me some lime and honey. I'm take probably a few shots of do say, courtesy of my guy Tyrone. Yo. <laughs> take me a few shots of do say and then go to sleep. <laughs> But um, I might do another master class on the FCRA very soon. And with that, it's really like, oh, I want y'all to know too, everything, every account that you think of that's on your consumer report, you can use consumer laws to delete them. It doesn't matter what it is. There's a law that pertains to everything. And once you crack the code on the law, it is super easy to get your deletions. So just keep that in mind. And you don't have to go under factual dispute. You don't have to do none of that. Straight laws, straight facts. So this is what I got for right now. I'll see you all on the flip side. Everyone have an amazing night. Good night. Thank you so much, Doreen. Feel better. Thank hey, you. Appreciate you, bro. Good night. Oh, Thank no you. Problem. Appreciate you, man.